here. We also have members of the Equity and Inclusion Council, Carlos Almeida, some of you met yesterday, Olivia Hubert, and Robin Worthington. Um, we, with a, a handful of other faculty members, have been planning Bristol's first Indigenous Peoples Day celebration for about a year. Um, this is the second day. There's one more day after this. And if you are able, please stick around after this demonstration. And uh, on, in the white tent outside, there will be tribal drumming beginning at 12.30. So you're welcome to stick around for that. Um, and I just wrote a little something I wanted to share with you. So Robin Wall Kimmer, who some of you know, the author of Breeding Seacrest, declares in her essay, Council of Teton, that all flourishing is mutual. In my classes, I challenge my students to think about what that means. They recognize that the statement, all flourishing is mutual, is about interdependence. It's about the idea that if one of us is oppressed, or silenced, or somehow compromised, we are all a little less. years ago, when I learned in my 30s about the Indian Residential School, which existed for an entire century in North America, it shifted something in me. These schools existed to kill the Indian and save the man. And the goal was assimilation, but the result was intergenerational trauma and sometimes death. There was no mention of these schools in the books I grew up with, and no mention of them in the history books I was given at school. Yet before me in my graduate school classes in New Mexico were teachers such as Acoma poet Simon Ortiz and Navajo poet Lucy Tapahansa, who spoke and sang in their native tongues, testimony in itself of a strength most of us can't even fathom. Strength that their ancestors had to muster to survive the schools and embrace the language somewhere deep inside, even as they were forbidden to speak it. So I've been on a journey ever since then to learn the truth from the source, native peoples themselves. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want a whitewashed history. As individuals and as a nation, not only can we handle the truth, but without it, we are living in a delusion. The shame and grief of a shared history of oppression of Native peoples is something we need to understand and process as a country. And without this reconciling, we will always be fractured and we will never flourish. So today you're going to meet Martin Lee Martinez. And his family and he have traveled all the way from San Ildefonso Pueblo. Yesterday we met Ron Wilburn and Lucy Lang Day, poets who came to share their poetry with us. And um, in November, you'll have the chance to meet Linda Coombs and Anna Juan Whedon for an Indigenous Film Festival. More about that later. Another quote that I love from Robin Wall Kimmer is from her story, A Mother's Work. It's about restoring a pond so her daughters can swim in it. In the story, she discovers that not until she is willing to step into the mud at the bottom of the pond and walk deeply into it is she able to make any real progress. She puts it this way, transformation is not accomplished by tentative waiting at the edge. May you dive in today with your whole heart and an open mind. May you listen and be transformed. Here's Olivia to introduce Mark. My name is Livia Lubert, and I work here at Bristol um, as the ESL program coordinator, and I'm also serving in the Committee for Indigenous Community. Marvin Lee, it's my pleasure to introduce Marvin Lee. Marvin Lee Martinez is a fourth generation potter and native of San Pedro Alfonso Pueblo, about 30 miles north of Santa Fe. Marvin learned to make pottery entirely by hand in the traditional style, using all local materials. His family's work is legendary, and his great-great-grandmother 
Maria Poveca Martinez's work is housed in museums and collections all over the world. Marvin feels that his pots are like his children, each one unique and needing special care. When Marvin is not working on his pots, he is spending time with his family and moving his oldest child on in her softball games. Um, hello, uh, good morning. Um, Marvin Lee Martinez, um, San Alfonso Pueblo, New Mexico. Um, San Alfonso Pueblo, like I said, is about maybe 25 miles northwest of Santa Fe, right under the, um, the well-known uh, Los Alamos. And so I still carry on uh, traditional, it's well-known as traditional black-on-black -black pottery. Um, I would be fourth generation. Um, great great grandparents Maria and Julian Martinez, um, like they stated, um, my family is well known for doing the pottery. <clears throat> so, if you just, I can go a little bit of the lineage and history. Um, if you want to take a look at the the slide up there, the the photos. So that would that would be my great great grandmother Maria and Julian. There is Adam and Santana. Those would be my great grandparents, but I knew them as my grandparents as to whereas my father, he was raised by his grandparents. So, and then the would be my grandmother, Viola Cruz Martinez, and my uncle, Johnny Cruz. Um, he's an active potter as well. He does the polychrome, traditional polychrome pottery um, as to, and he does the black on black as well. Um, but during the early stages of Maria's Maria and Julian, she was well known for doing polychrome. Um, and it wasn't until um, 1916, 1919, around there, it was, it was dated, um, that she revised the black on black. Um, there's a neighboring Pueblo, which is Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, they're well known for doing the black as well, but with theirs, traditionally, they were not well known for etching or carving in their pieces. The, re the revision came about was where Maria was able to achieve a higher shine by stone burnishing it, and her husband Julian painted on top of it. So that was where the revision came about. Um, so Santa Clara Pueblo, they did the um, black on black, but like I said, they either etched or carved, and then the revision came about where Maria and Julian um, painted on top of it. So that was the whole differences between the the revision. Um, and there's my father. Um, my mother and father, they still do the work as well. Um, I don't have a picture of my mother up there. She camera shy. <laughs> so um, that's my father. You know, he's photogenic. He loves to take pictures. So um, my, my mother, uh, my father, Marvin, and my mother, Francis, they still do the, the work as well. Um, but the interesting part is uh, my mother, She's from Santa Clara Pueblo, like how I described that they do the black as well. So her, she comes from a pottery family too. Um, they are Benarita and Marcus Naranjo. She was raised by her grandparents. So they would be my great grandparents, but I knew them as grandma and grandpa. Um, they did the black as well, but they either etched or carved in their pieces. So that's where my mother learned how to do the black as well. Um, and so both of them, Coming together, my mother and father, both from pottery families, um, they decided that they wanted to continue on the tradition. And at one point, they had to um, choose which side they were going to do, whether it was going to be the Santa Clara traditional black on black, which is the etched or the carved, or they were going to do my father's side, which was the painting on it. So. And during that, they were kind of like um, experimenting with both sides, but then it ultimately had to come down to where as their, their parents, grandparents, you know, had to tell them, you know, well, hey, you need to choose one or the other. Um, so ultimately, they chose my father's side, which is the, um, the Maria and Julian Martinez, the legacy of that, um, with the black on black. Um, from San Alfonso Pueblo. So that's still what we continue on today is just the traditional black on black. Um, and there's myself. Um, we did a, a Santa Fe Indian Market. This year was the centennial. Um, so myself, my mother and father, 
Um, we represented the family this year within the art market. So it's a world um, recognized market that they do have in Santa Fe. Um, thousands of artists are there. Um, tons of thousands, like close to 5,000, 10,000 people visit the market um, annually. Um, and so about my, and then about my family that I have, um, I have my fiance, Alexandria Dashno. Um, Hannah Martinez is my oldest, and um, Hannah, Autumn, and Nathaniel. <clears throat> so there's, yeah, they're right there in the back. Um, they're dressed up traditionally, like with our traditional wear um, from San Alfonso Pueblo. So, you know, in represents for Indigenous uh, Week, you know, we de decided to bring them out and have them dress in what we normally would wear for like traditional dances or anything that goes on within the Pueblo. Um, so they can come up and do a little twirl if they want, but. <laughs> But yeah, this would just be just traditional wear that they would have. Um, this would be a rain, a rain sash belt right here. This would represent the rain coming down the sash and then just the traditional black manta. And normally this is how a child would dress. Um, and then when they become of age, then they would just see she doesn't have the undershirt on there. So when she comes of age, then she um, is able to wear a different style to wear as a kid's they have to wear the long sleeves. Um, and then just the traditional white wraps, the moccasins. And this is normally how um, a boy or a man would dress as well. So um, it's just a little demonstration of, um, you know, showing how uh, we, tr we dress traditionally uh, when we do have ceremonies or um, things going on with the Pueblo. So um, thanks. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so then um, we can go ahead and, so I'm just gonna do a little um, description about the whole process of the pottery. Um, so on the left side right there, you would see uh, the um, natural brown clay, um, and then on the other side was the uh, volcanic ash. And here's just the mixing of clay. It's about, we pound it, sift it, um, to get the finer materials from it. Um, equal ratio, about one to one, uh, mixed with just water, um, gives us the natural brown clay. And then just to say that all of the materials that I do use or my family does use, um, we gather all our own materials from the clays, the wood, the manures that I'll explain later on that we use. Um, we all harvest it locally within our Pueblo. So nothing is done commercially. Um, we harvest our own materials ourselves. So everything is still kept the traditional way. Um, and it's just a little demonstration of me doing the pottery start to finish. Um, and then I'll, I'll make a little piece here as well. Um, <laughs> it's a little problem. <clears throat> and then I'll also, so like if you see on the table right there, um, in the bag on the right side, that one is this, the traditional brown clay. Um, and then the temper that I use is the volcanic ash. Um, the reason for the volcanic ash is that it acts as a temper during the firing so that because it reaches the, during the firing it reaches such high heat so quickly. Um, it was, it's been a while since I believe any kind of temperature was taken, but it's a traditional pit firing. So it was recorded at one time to be um, 1900 degrees plus so it gets very hot very quickly, so it, it really gets going. So it's just, uh, just uh, during, the, during the process, it really um, reaches the heat. And then the other thing that I have is the next stage after I make the pieces, um, to get the shine on them, you'll see like the demonstration, I mean the pieces that are out here, it's a natural red iron oxide. So it's a natural mineral I gather myself. This right here, I screen it to get like the roots, the rocks, the pebbles out of it. So it's just, um, it becomes a very fine, silky slip. So with this slip, I will put four to six coats on each piece. Like this is just the raw one right here. So I would pour to put four to six coats on this piece and then I would get, these are my burnishing stones um, that were passed down to me by my mother and my father and um, their grandparents gave it to them. So this. So then after I put four to six coats on each piece, 
I stone burnish it to get the shine. So it's all shiny. And then I come back to it and I hand paint the designs with that same red iron oxide to get the designing on it. So that's the process of the burnishing part and the designing process of it. Um, can you go ahead real quick? So there's the same thing that I just explained this. Like this right here is the left side and then this one would be the, the other side. So a little example and then the designing on it I do everything's all hand painted hand done so um, I outline the pieces it's a reverse designing so the 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 negative would be the actual matted designing on it and then the paint the um, shine would be the actual design which is the positive on it so it's a reverse designing and then like how I was explaining the menores um, if you can, yeah so like on the pictures there up there um, we do a traditional pit firing still. Um, we use cedar wood, cow manure, and horse manure. So the cedar wood you see in the middle picture on the bottom, you can see like in the corners you see the cedar wood. Um, and then cedar wood, and then more locally would be easier to get would be the juniper, juniper wood. Um, so then it, the wood would be on the bottom. We'd make a sh makeshift box out of old military mesh trays that we had. And then, um, so that would, and then after that we'd cover it and then the, we cover it, we cover it with um, cow manure, cow patties. And so the cow patties acts as an insulation during the firing so that it keeps the whole, um, the baking process, it keeps the heat evenly distributed all the way around because it, they act as coals. Um, so it's keeping an even temperature around the whole firing. And then the next part, would be, so it would bake anywhere from about, mm, about maybe 45 minutes to an hour, just depending on the size of the pizzas and how much is in there. Um, and then we smother it with horse manure. When we smother it with the horse manure, it's a reduction firing. So when we smother it, the oxygen inside is reduced, the carbon from the smoke, we entrap all the smoke, we try not to let any escape, and the carbon fuses to the red iron oxide, and that's how we achieve the black, the traditional black on black. So that's how we get the black. And if you know smoke is to escape, or oxygen is to get inside, it'll re it'll restart the firing in there because you know the fire feeds off of oxygen. Um, so it would bring it back, and it would get hot again, and it would eventually turn the pieces back to like a chocolatey, reddish color. It wouldn't be the, the same red, but it'd be like a chocolate color because it was baked. Um, so that's basically the whole process. It takes anywhere from about two to three weeks start to finish. So it is, it is a rigorous process and um, patience, lots and lots of patience. Um, so, but this is what, um, this is the tradition and legacy that I still carry on um, through my family. I love doing this. Um, I've been doing this for about maybe 10 years now, full time, and I love, I love what I do. And you know, as you guys are going into, or you guys are in school, you know, you guys will figure out or what you guys may major in or go to school for. And you know, you're gonna do, wanna do something that you love and makes you happy to go to work every day. Um, and go to school to learn what you want to do. So um, this is what I do, and this is what I wanted to do. Um, I, beginning of, after I turned 18, um, I got a job in a casino. Um, I did it for about maybe seven years, and casino life is no life. <laughs> um, you know, holidays off, didn't get holidays off. Um, was always work doing overtime and all that and you know uh, one thing that my family has always told me is that um, the pottery is always going to be here um, I learned it since I was young growing up going to my grandparents house helping them out pound the clay sift it for them um, learning in different stages and um, they always told me as well this is here for you um, we're teaching you you know you can embrace it or you're not but you know, you always know that this will be here and it's here for you to continue on. Um, so eventually I realized you know, that I wanted to come back to it and um, do the pottery and 
for the past 10 years, it's really blessed myself, it's blessed my family, and I love sharing with what I do. Um, so I, I can go ahead and do a little, you know, demonstration show, uh, making a piece, I can um, burnish a piece too, and you know, if we have enough time, I can do a little painting just to show um, a little bit of the, try to squeeze it in the whole process. Um, so I can go ahead and make a piece real quick. And you know, if anybody has any questions or anything um, while I'm doing the demonstration, anyone's more than welcome to ask. Um, I yeah, doesn't I bother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's open. So if you guys have any questions, um, you're more than welcome to ask. You know, um, my daughter Hannah, if she wants, you know, she can jump in and answer some of the questions, but um, I'll just go ahead. So this is the brown clay right here. It comes like in a rock form, so I have to dissolve it. And then I just get the finer materials from it, um, sift it. And then this is the volcanic ash. So this one is really, when we work with the volcanic ash, we have to um, sometimes wear like a mask because it, it's, a, it's like a glass particles from the shards, so it's really, um, when you breathe it in, it's not good. Um, we, a lot of when we go to checkups from the hospital, they always tell us, you know, be careful what you're doing and take extra. One time my father, I mean my mother, she does the burnishing with their work. Um, she went to a checkup and they um, more so, when they did her blood work, they found that she had a lot of iron within her system. Um, and the iron was from the red iron oxide because when we're burnishing, you know, we sometimes we don't have a cloth or we're just like in a rush and it's just normal to lick it and then wipe it off and clean it. So that's where she had a lot of iron um, that they found in her body. You know, they asked her, well, how come you have all this, this iron within your blood? And so that was from, she told them I do pottery and I lick it. And so, yeah, so we had more so we try to have a cloth next to us and clean it off like that. Yeah, and with the masks, uh, when we're like sanding or um, pounding, um, they always tell us wear a mask, wear a mask, because you know, inhaling the clays for a period, long period of time is not good for your, you know, your airways. Um, the pounding of it, so when we go and gather the clays, um, we maybe get about, the five gallon buckets, we maybe get about maybe three to four buckets, and that would last us about maybe four to five months. You know, one of the main, the, the, the main um, rule of thumb is, you know, take what you need, don't take in excess. Um, because there are, are, there are other potters out there that still do the work as well, um, their own traditional um, that they do. So, you know, we have to leave some for the next person as well. And we all follow that same rule as, you know, take what you need, don't take in excess because it's still gonna be there. Um, there's times where the vein may, we call it veins where the, of the clays. So it, obviously it's gonna run short. So when that happens, then, you know, we help each other out and let each other know where another vein may be that we can get some and then, um, We'll either that or we'll go out hiking and searching for some more. So that's how that works with the clays. Um, so, and then it comes in a rock form. So like I said, we have to pound it, sift it. Um, so that's another whole day. And if the clay is wet when we gather it, then we have to set it out and let it dry. And we don't want one side of the pot bigger than the other. So all I'm doing is just rolling it out. And so this would be a traditional round coil. So it'd just be the round coils like that. And then some of them would take this and just put it on right away. Um, with myself, I don't do, I find it hard. I would um, use more of the clay that way. So then I do a slab method. So you see me pressing it down into a slab. And as you're seeing, there's no wheels or anything involved, potter's wheels or anything, it's all traditionally hand done. So then I'll just go ahead and get it. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna place it on the inside. And so this is where the mending comes. 
so then I'll just go ahead and take that off. And then I'm gonna, with the, where the coils meet right here, I'm just gonna take my thumb on the inside and mend the coils together on the inside and then on the outside. I'm gonna do the same thing, just press it so that they form together so it's like that. And then when I'm mending the slab coil, I'm pushing down with my thumb on the inside to mend it so that it secures it and there's no air bubbles in there. So I'm pressing it down with my thumb on the inside to mend it. And then on the outside, what I'm going to do is I'm pushing up. So the base of it, so I'm just pushing up right here. Yes, and each one, like mine, like I was explaining the coils, you know, each person may have their own, their own tricks or um, they may do something else a little bit different. Um, but as you see, maybe in some of the videos or some of the books, uh, Maria um, does a lot of the, does only the coil, the round coil. Um, so it, whatever works for the person, Um, it has done, we've, um, my mother and father I, and I have done um, art residencies, art residencies at a couple museums, um, but um, we haven't done any recently, um, but for the most part, um, if anybody's more than willing to learn um, uh, then we would be more than willing to um, to show or teach, but you know, like I said, it is a long process, so it does take a long period of like two to three weeks to actually start, um, you know, to get the final product. So it is a long process. Oh yeah. So one of the places that I show showcase my work, um, there's a few galleries in Santa Fe and a couple museums that do showcase and show my work that are available too. So, um, but one of the main places where I do show it's it's well known as uh, um, the New Mexico Santa Fe. Well, it's the art the Palace of Governors Artisan Program. Um, it's a it's registered as an educational program. Um, for the city of Santa Fe and New Mexico, the New Mexico museums, um, but it's located in Santa Fe, downtown Santa Fe, and um, it, it gives the Native Americans, it was formed to, for artists, whether it's jewelry, um, silversmith, pottery, painting, um, it was formed so that they would be able to um, make an income, but then be able to go back home and uh, do their traditions. Um, so that's where that program was brought in. But in order to get into that program is that um, first you have to be a Native American, a, tri a tribally enrolled Native American from New Mexico. Um, secondly is that w when you, whatever work you're gonna show, you have to demonstrate in front of a group of people so that they authenticate your work is done by yourself. So when I got into the program, I had to submit an application. Um, takes about maybe three to four years, five years to actually um, for them to get to your application. And from there, you, um, you have to um, demonstrate the work start to finish. So pounding the clays, making a clay, and then um, making a pottery, burnishing, painting, and then as well as, you know, do the whole firing. So it takes a whole, for myself, it took a whole day for me to, and then I just basically did the same thing as I'm doing here. You know, I had some clays ready, mixed the clay, then I had the pot ready to burnish and paint, and then uh, we had pieces to fire, so then I, burnt, I fired. So that authenticates that I do my own work. 
um, and that um, everything that I do tell to people, um, to collectors, that it's all true and it's myself. Um, and so each person that does sound there, they have to go through that same process. And so that's one of the unique programs. One of the uniqueness of, of that program is that it's um, all authenticated, the stones and all that the, for the jewelry. It's all um, authenticated and real. And they do daily inspections there of all the work daily. So it's, it's well recognized um, throughout the US as a program there. So that's one of the fun things that is from Santa Fe that I do participate in as well. Um, let's see, let me run to the restroom book to wash my hands and then I'll do a, so this is basically almost like a rough part of making a piece, so it's rounded out. Normally I would have a, a gourd, um, a cutout of a gourd and place it on the inside to get more of the roundness. So then I would get the gourd and put it on the inside and then just work it out and still using my hands to shape it out. So that would be using of the gourd to shape the roundness of it. Um, so let me just go ahead and wash my hands real quick and then I'll be back to do a burnishing part real quick. I'm praying and hoping, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, it, I didn't take inches to it. You know, I thought of it just being as, oh, they're making me work, they're making me do their, their job. Um, but, you know, as looking, looking back as it now, you know, they were teaching me the steps of how to do it. Um, so you know, with my kids, my children, um, you know, I'm doing the same thing with them that I was taught. I'm, I'm, they go out with me and gather the materials, the clays. Um, they, and one of the good thing is that when, um, with our history and our traditions, a lot of it is passed orally. So, you know, it's told through stories, through events, and um, the songs they're passed on orally. Um, so when we go out and get the clays or we're out getting the materials, um, you know, that's where my time is to pass on the traditions, pass on the history to my kids. And so it's a learning process as well. And that's one of the things that I cherished when I was growing up, um, getting the materials with my father and my grandparents um, was them telling me the stories, the history um, of, of about my Pueblo and what happened. Um, and that I, you know, I need to continue on important events that happened that, you know, I have knowledge about and that I still carry on. Um, so that's the uh, plus side of, you know, doing the work. But um, my kids right now, they're, they're in the stages of learning, pounding, sifting. Whenever they see me working with clay, one of them come along, like my little one, Nathaniel. He comes along, grabs the clay, just plays with it, um, you know, has fun. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, he'll say he makes a dinosaur or, you know, <laughs> abstract, you know. But, you know, he's getting the feel for it. And one of the things, one of the things he likes to do is, uh, we all like to do is like when we're making the clays, you know, it's just the, when you smell the rain hitting the dirt, it's just purifying. And so um, my son, sometimes he likes to come up and, you know, he'll, I'll see him in the corner, I'll act like I don't see him, but he'll be on the side and he'll come and steal a little piece and eat it. Um, but when you eat it, you know, it's, it's, it's as, we take that as a blessing because it's, um, it's inside you and it's going to be inside you forever. And so, but you know, too much is not good, but you know, he'll come and steal a little piece and eat it. And you know, he's just taking it in and, um, you know, enjoying it. And so, you know, I'm praying like you had asked that one of my kids still continued on and my daughter, I hope one of them, you know, finds interest so they can start burnishing and I won't have to do it no more. <laughs> But, you know, um, my fiance, she shows interest in it as well. Um, you know, I hope and pray that one day we're going to be able to continue on the tradition together. Um, to whereas if it's just not myself, I would want, you know, somebody to share it with me as well. Um, so I'm hoping that my kids one day that, you know, like I said in the beginning, it's always going to be here. The pottery is going to be here. 
and it's up to the individual when they want to come back. Um, eventually, I'll call them back, and if they want to do it, they'll do it. So um, I pray that my kids will still carry it on and hopefully still doing this the same thing someday. Um, so I hope that answers a little bit. So I hope my kids do continue it on um, because, you know, it is passed on to generation. I would be the fourth generation. It was passed on to me by my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, and my father and mother um, on both sides. So I still continue it on, and I hope that my kids um, still learn, you know, if not them, then they'll, or I'll be able to teach their kids, my grandchildren, this, and maybe hopefully one of them will carry it on. So, um, but I, you know, I do have an older sister and a younger brother. <clears throat> uh, out of us three, I was the main one that carried it on. Um, they know how to do certain steps here and there, but um, my brother, my younger brother, he's finally starting to come back to it and he's showing interest in doing it so he's slowly starting the process of um, making the pieces and doing the whole thing so you know that's good that he hopefully continues it on and he carries it on as well so um, yeah you know <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna burnish a piece real quick so this is the red iron oxide that I had showed you guys earlier um, so I'm just going to mix it up because it does settle on the bottom. So it does come in a rock form. So I have to dissolve it. It takes months of periods of time to actually dissolve. So I do it in a, a maybe like a half of a five gallon bucket. And um, I, so I have to dissolve it. And so it takes a long time for it to dissolve. Once it's dissolved, I screen it to get any of the impurities out, the like the rocks, the roots, um, and it becomes a very fine, silky slip. As you see, I'm putting it on. So it would be four to five coats, four to six coats on each piece, just depending. Also, you don't want to put too much because if the the pottery, the piece is too thin, it's going to um, eventually penetrate it, and it could... Um, crack the pieces if it's too thin so that's what you want to look out for too and ultimately it's the potter when you're um, when you're scraping it to thin it out during the drying stage and then when you sand it you know you fill each side um, you know how much you're you know the clay so it'll you'll be able to know how much how much you can push it and so I just put four to six coats on each piece, so I'm doing that. Um, just so that when I rub it, it penetrates the pottery so that it doesn't come off. And then um, the other reason is when I rub it, I want, I want to make sure that there's enough so that there's a layer so that it doesn't uh, rub off into the, the, um, the clay, and ultimately that will distort the shine on it. So that's the reason for the coats on there. So then you'll see, in a few minutes, you'll see me rubbing it. And then you'll see, you'll see kind of like why the coats are put on there so that it penetrates it and gives like a little thin coating on the pot so that it doesn't, um, so it keeps the shine. And so we'll just let this one. So that was, so I did enough for about maybe two coats right there real quick. And so I'll just wait that for to dry a little bit and then I'll put on a, another coat on it. So then, um, you know, these are my burnishing stones, like I explained earlier, that have been passed on um, from my mother and my father. Um, this one right here was from my mother. It was given to her by her grandmother. Um, so she gave it to me. She had a couple of rocks and you know, she ultimately said, you know, uh, you know, I feel that you're ready to carry it on, um, the burnishing. So, you know, she laid a couple of rocks in front of me and said, you know, fill them, touch them, see what works for you. And so this is the one that I chose. And um, it's been, you can see the indentions on it from rubbing it throughout the, rubbing the pottery throughout the years. So there's a little indention on there. And so, you know, that, that's what I, that's one of my main rocks that I use. 
And so each one, each rock has its own purpose that I use it for, like the largest stone that I have in front of me. That one I use for larger pieces. And then the, the one that I was holding, that was for like the smaller ones. And so this is like the third coat. Yes. With the with during the making of the pieces, like when I demonstrated that one, um, you know, you have to be in a good mind, and uh, you know, you have to be wanting to do it. If you, you know, if you if you feel like you're making yourself do it, the pottery or the clay is not going to work with you at all. So you have to be in a good good mood, wanting to touch the clay and work with it. Um, you know, if not, it's not going to work at all. It's just going to frustrate and then you just come back. But, you know, when I finally get in that groove of making it, you know, I could spend practically all day just making. I could get maybe like 20 pieces done. And, you know, it's just because, you know, I was I was happy. I was in my own world, I should say. It's a it's like a meditation part and it you know, clears my mind. Sometimes, you know, I'll sit there and think of, you know, the kids um, doing the pottery, me showing them, or traditions, or, you know, just what's going on. And so it, it, it's really a soothing process for me when I do make. And then also, you know, sometimes I'll just sit there, throw on my earphones, listen, listen to some music while I'm doing it. Um, so it, it's, it's just like anything, and like it's it's work, but it's something that I enjoy doing, um, and that's what any kind of work that anybody does, they, you know, they should enjoy doing it. And so this one's going to be the last one. Yeah. <clears throat> and no like commercial slips or anything. This is all traditionally gathered and all that. So So now it's just drying. I'm going to let it dry out a little bit um, and then I'll pat it down just so that um, the, the slip sticks to the pot. So I just let it dry out a little bit and then let me go ahead and get ready real quick. Um, there's deposits around the Pueblo um, thousands of millions of years ago. There was the, um, the Valles Calderas up in the Jemez Mountains. That one, it, the Valles Calderas, that was uh, one of the largest volcanoes that had erupted um, in, the war in the U.S., the world. And so there are um, volcanic deposits surrounding the area. So that's how we find the, the volcanic ash. So there's deposits around. So that's how we get the ash. And the ash, you know, acts as a temper during the firing. So that would, during the firing, you know, it able to absorb the heat. And so that's where, like if we're doing an evening firing in the night, um, you know, just to check the pieces, we'll lift the top and we'll be able to see the, the pots actually glowing red hot in the firing. So they're actually absorbing the heat. And that's one of the cool things that when we fire in the evening is that we're able to see the pieces glowing when we check it. So, and then, you know, ultimately, um, you know, it only bakes for about maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but during that process, it does crystallize the clay. So like when, you know, as, some um, ceramics, they know how to, to test to see if it's fired thoroughly. You know, you give it that tap. If you hear the pieces ring, 
then you, you know that the piece has been fired thoroughly. Um, and it also, if you hear that ring, there's no imperfections, meaning like um, no cracks or anything of it. Because if there's an imperfection, meaning like a crack, it's going to be a dull thug. So you, that's where you know it's baked thoroughly. So if you know if you do a, the tap test on any of the black pieces on the table, you'll hear the um, you'll hear the crystal-like sound. So now I'm just slowly rubbing the piece with the stone, um, l applying light pressure. If I apply too much, it's gonna take the slip off the piece. So I'm just slowly rubbing it. And you know I have to know each piece, the size of it, because I have to at least rub it before it dries. If it dries, then that's when I'll start getting like the streaks, the scratch mark streaks on it. And so I'm just rubbing it, and then as you can probably see, it's giving it that little shine sheen to it. And so. And when I'm polishing, you know, it, um, burnishing, it has to, there has to be no airflow in the room. If there's too much airflow, it's gonna um, dry the piece out quickly. So there has to be a, there has to be no airflow within the room, so that's kind of hard doing during the summers there, you know if it's really hot in the house you know we can't turn on the fans while I'm polishing because it's gonna um, dry the pieces out quickly and then I'll have to go back and um, sand it so that's when you know I really dislike the su working in the summers because it really. You're just sitting there sweating everything out and so so now I'm just getting around inside the lip of the piece so that you know it's all shiny all the way through and then you know as you see me rubbing it on the cloth that's just wiping off the axis um, the axis slip that comes off that's on the stone. So then I'll just come back to it again, go over it again to get it just to smooth it out. And then I just look in the light, the reflection of it to see where I maybe have missed burnishing it. And some people um, like the ceramics uh, they all have their own tricks or the trade, you know, some of them, if you use a spoon, this, the backside of a spoon and rub it on, you know, like this, it's going to give that same effect. Um, so whether you use a stone or a spoon, um, it'll still give that, that shine to it. So some of them, they may use like a stone or they may use a, a spoon to do this part. Yeah, so deciding what goes, like the designs on the pieces, that all depends on the burnishing, the polishing part. Um, so I, I look, well, before I start designing the pieces, I look at each piece and, you know, I may see where the little imperfections of the burnishing's at. And ultimately, I paint the designs so that it hides the imperfections. So you'll see like a lot of the pieces on there. I painted over the design so that it hides the, maybe like a scratch mark or a nick. Um, Cause when I'm polishing, um, you know, a, my nail maybe scratch it and then, you know, I'll leave a little scratch mark on it. So then I look at the pieces and then that's when I decide, you know, should I put a feather on it, a feather design or should I put a, a vanu, meaning the water stripping on it? And it just all depends on how the piece looks. And, you know, some of them with, uh, 
it's really hard to come across a piece to where it's just the burnished itself because, you know, uh, a potter has to really take pride in that certain piece because there's no imperfections on it. It's just all shiny. So that's a, those, are, those pieces are really hard to come across, you know, especially with this work is to being able to leave a pot with no design on it. And so this one's almost done. Um, I actually, when I got here, I forgot another, I forgot the, so this would be halfway done. Um, so this is how it looked before. Um, I forgot, so the next step after this, um, some, some people, have their own ways, the methods of doing it. Um, I've heard people, they use olive oil or they use um, some type of oil. And what it is is that they put it on the piece. So they would put it in their hands, they would rub it and put it on there. Um, with myself and my family, we use um, the fat from an animal, like the grease. So we cook it. We don't spray any kind of oils on the pan or anything. So when we cook it, we save the grease. And then so uh, with the grease, I, I had some on here. Let me see. Yeah, so I have, I don't know if this is enough, but we use the animal grease, the animal fat, and we put it on the piece. Let's see if there's still some. And so with that, so the next step would be putting it and rubbing it on the piece. And then we let it come to like a cloudy film on it. And then we come back and burnish on top of it again. So that's what would give the high shine to it. So that would be the next step after that. But I spaced it out and I forgot it in the fridge. Um, but so that would be the next step after this. So you can still see it's a little, you know, shiny. But in order to get it that next step, you would take, um, we, I use the grease and I put it on there and let it sit. And then I would come back and burnish it again. And that's what would give the higher shine to it. Um, so that would be the next step of that. But I don't have it. So the ne just I would put the grease on it and start burnishing it again. And that's what would give it. But it does have like, you know, a, a, like a sheen to it as well like this. But to take it to the next step to a higher shine, you would um, put the grease or some people use oil, um, some type of oil, whether it's like vegetable oil or olive oil, virgin olive oil, I don't know. Some, some people use different, but we use the animal fat, the grease from the, um, when we cook it. So that's that. Um, and then let's see. So then, and then like the next step I was saying, you know, we paint, I paint the, the designs on it. So it just varies on the pieces. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Let's see if we can, these, on the thing, if I could go to like where the pieces are done for the, the designs on them. So they're all hand done, they're all hand painted. Um, traditionally, they would be painted with like a yucca, the fibers from the yucca plant. Um, so they would pull the small, they would pull the small leaves from the yucca plant and they would chew on it. And then they would mean like taking off the meat of the yucca plant and they would leave the fiber strands on it. Um, so they would cut it, they'd maybe leave like two or three fiber strands on the yucca, and, and that would be the paintbrush that they would use to do the designing. Um, I've done it a couple times, um, but you know, the yucca plant doesn't taste good. So, um, but you know, that's one of the traditional ways of painting or designing the pieces. Um, now, more easily, you know, I just use a, um, a paint a liner brush, and so, that's what I use now instead of the, the yucca plant. So then some of you guys were asking about the designings on them. Um, there are two main designs that my family is well known for doing um, that I still carry on. Would be the eagle feather design. Those would be the top two in the corners. Eagle feather design, that design was revised by my great grandparents, um, well, my great great grandfather, Julian Martinez. Um, in the early 1900s, um, he worked with the archaeologists in Santa Fe. Um, the archaeologists came back from Silver City 
um, they were doing an excavation. They brought some pottery shards down from there. Um, it had a design on there. They asked Julian, they knew that Maria and Julian did the pottery. So they asked him if, they, if he could revise and reproduce this design. And that one there was the eagle feather design. So, and then the pottery shards where they had got it from was Silver City, was the tribe down there was the Mimbris tribe. And so they, he did, he looked at it, he revised it, and they asked him if they could do it in black because uh, Maria and Julian, they were well known for doing polychrome. So they wanted it in the black. So that's kind of where the uh, experimental stages started with the black, being able to burnish it to get a higher shine and then the firing process to get it like a gunmetal shine. So that's one of the other things is that um, Maria and Julian is well known for is achieving a gunmetal shine to it, gunmetal sheen. Um, so that was one of the things. So the eagle feather design, it's, it looks like a knife, but it's like the jackknife feathers, the jackknife wings of the eagles. And so that would represent um, strength, guidance, and prayers. <clears throat> The other one that we're, uh, my family is well known for doing and I still carry on would be in our language, our Tewa language, it's, its name is the Avanyu. It's, uh, it's, revs, it's, a, it's a, wa a rain and water serpent. So it's a prayer for rain and water. Um, with that design, you know, if you go to New Mexico to a lot of like the, the petroglyphs, the old petroglyphs out there, um, the, like the designs they drew on the rocks, you would see this design in certain places. It's a prayer for rain and water. So like the arrow coming out of the mouth up there, that would represent um, the lightning. And then the horn on the back, I like to do just a traditional one horn. That's how traditionally it's drawn. Um, my father, when he paints his pieces, he likes to do a trident. It's like, it looks like a, a trident that he does on the horn. And so that would represent like the thunder and then just the waves of the water of the serpent going down in the rivers. So that's kind of where the symbolic is of the serpent is that just the waves of the water going down the streams or the lakes. Um, and so it's just a prayer for rain and water. Then rain clouds, um, you know, prayer for rain. And then right there on the bottom right, that one would be um, a bear. The bear represents for strength. And then it has the heart line on there. And then the X's on that one would be for the stars. Um, so there's just, and then there's also other designs that, um, you know, just traditional Puebloan designs that still put on that are still carried on. So that's like a little bit of the, the designing history there. But those are the two main ones that my family is well known for doing and that I still carry on is the eagle feather design and the serpent, the Vanyu. Um, so, and then, um, you know, just a little thing is that, you know, um, there is a lot of history, a lot of books, a lot of um, videos, you know, YouTube, search, you know, Maria and Julian. Um, my father, Marvin Martinez, he has a couple of videos out um, where he shows th the process start to finish. Um, and there's books. Um, you'll see a lot of um, museums around the world carries my family's work. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of history and, you know, Ultimately, you know, I love what I do. I love to carry this on. Um, brings me, and you can obviously, I love talking about it. So, um, you know, as you guys are going on, going on, you know, through the schools or whatever you, you guys may want to do, you know, um, I hope you guys find something that you guys love to do, continue it. And, um, you know, because it's going to be something of you and something that you can stand and be proud of to say, you know, I'm this, I'm that, and this is what I do. So, you know, I wish you guys all the best of luck with whatever you guys are doing, um, you know, and do it with your whole heart, just exactly what I'm doing. When I do my work, I put my whole self into each piece. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, you know, I treat each piece as my child. Um, you know, if, when I do ship them, um, I, this, the pandemic, you know, I ship pieces all over the, all over the U.S., um, some overseas um, because, you know, everything was closed. And so that was my means of, you know, getting my work out. And um, so, you know, I pack them, make sure that, you know, take extra care, extra bubble wrap, um, you know, each piece, you know, it'll give you that certain feeling 
Um, I may have like, uh, when I'm on the portel, you know, I may have like 15 to 20 pieces out and, you know, some, some uh, you know, tourists or customers or they'll come and look, they may know the history, um, but there's that certain piece that will call to them and they'll be drawn to it and they'll be like, you know, I want that. Or, you know, they'll, it just, it's an, like they say, like an aura that brings to it. And, you know, each piece, I put my whole self into each piece. Um, and each piece, you know, carries a part of myself with it. So, you know, whatever you guys decide to do, you guys put your whole self into it. You know, take pride in what you do and um, continue it, you know. So when you guys do have a family, you're able to leave that legacy behind and um, be known for what you do. So, you know, um, other than that, you know, I'm open to questions. If you guys have anything, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, and so, I'll, I mean, I'll be here for the most part. Um, so, yeah, so that I'm we have to go for appointments or whatever um, class that's officially over. But like I said, you're invited to the, the courtyard, the tent.